Good. Well, a very warm welcome uh, tonight for Johannes Nikes' inaugural professorial lecture. Uh, I've been asked to provide a little bit of safety information first, in particular in the event of a fire alarm. There are fire exits around the room. And in the event of a fire alarm, please follow the, the exit signs and leave the lecture theater. And there's assembly point on Exhibition Road. Uh, in the event of a water landing, however, it's not clear what you'll do. <laughs> so let me say a few words about Johannes before we get started with the main event. So Johannes got his PhD uh, in Leuven, at the university in, in Leuven, in 2005, or 2004, rather. Uh, his PhD topic was on Igusa Zeta functions and motivic generating series. He then held a research position uh, in the French uh, research system, CRNS, uh, at the University of Lille uh, from 2006 until he continues in that position today, but has been on leave for many years. Uh, then he went back to his home university in Leuven, where he was a very successful researcher for many years, and then was hired as a reader at Imperial College uh, starting in 2015, and was promoted to professor in 2018. Uh, at the same time, he's continued to spend 50% of time in Leuven, so he's making good use of the Eurostar, and uh, I think is leading a very happy life uh, split between the, the continent and, and England. I might also add that uh, he's done a number of other interesting things in, in life. So after he completed his PhD, he spent six months studying history uh, with the eye of changing course. But fortunately for mathematics, and perhaps unfortunately for history, he decided to stay <laughs> in mathematics. So perhaps uh, without much further ado, I can introduce Professor Nikes, who will be speaking on why computers can't replace mathematicians yet. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, for the, for, the, for the introduction. And uh, well, thanks to you all for, for coming. When uh, the college first approached me about giving this inaugural lecture, kind of imagined, uh, well, one of our smaller lecture rooms uh, with 15 board colleagues uh, sitting through the talk. So I was definitely not expecting this. Uh, it's wonderful to see that so many people show up for a lecture uh, about, about pure mathematics. So um, I want uh, to start uh, with a small disclaimer, uh, especially for uh, my colleague Kevin Buzzard, uh, who has reasons to be upset about my title. So what I don't want to claim is that uh, mathematics don't already play an in incredibly important role in, in mathematical research, even in pure mathematics. Um, they help us to visualize geometric problems. Uh, they allow us to do uh, numerical experiments in number theory and in, in other domains. And uh, Kevin Buzzard can uh, give you a fascinating lectures about how computers can help us to check the validity of mathematical proofs. So it's clear that they play an essential role already and that their role will only grow in the future. Uh, what I want to uh, explain in my talk is that uh, nevertheless, there are some fundamental uh, limitations to what computers can, can do for a mathematician, at least uh, the way computers are, are conceived uh, at, at the present time. Um, and uh, in fact, there are some fundamental limitations to what any formal system can, uh, can achieve, as, as we will see. And I'm going to uh, illustrate this by means of one of the oldest uh, topics in, in mathematics, which is the, the theory of Diophantine equations. So uh, these equations uh, got their name from uh, a Hellenistic scholar, uh, Diophantus of Alexandria, uh, who was active probably in the third uh, century AD, uh, but very little is uh, known about his, his life. Um, but uh, he wrote a very influential book called uh, Arithmetica, um, in fact, consisting of, of, of several books. And he, he discussed the problem of finding uh, um, integer or rational solutions for polynomial equations with integer coefficients. And so such uh, equations are now called uh, Diophantine equations in uh, Diophantus' uh, honor. And uh, I'm sure that uh, everyone here has uh, seen at least one, of example, one example of a Diophantine equation. The, the most famous one is the, the Fermat equation. Uh, so if we fix uh, any integer n at least three, 
then um, we can ask uh, what are the integers x, y, and z satisfying x to the power n plus y to the power n equals z to the power n. And uh, famously, Fermat claimed uh, that uh, the only triples x, y, and z satisfying this property, well, are the ones where at least one of x, y, and z must be equal to zero. Um, and this problem is famous also because of the, the backstory. Uh, Fermat wrote down this claim in a margin of uh, a copy of Diophantis' book, which he was studying at the moment, uh, at the time. Uh, and uh, he also added uh, that he had uh, a truly amazing proof for this statement, but unfortunately the margin was just a little bit too narrow to, to contain the proof. Uh, so many mathematicians after Fermat tried to actually come up with a proof. Many of them thought they had found an actual proof, but uh, all of their proofs turned out to be uh, erroneous or incomplete until, uh, well, 1995, where the first complete proof of the statement was uh, published by, uh, by Andrew Wiles. And uh, Wiles' this proof uses a lot of technology that was developed in the course of the 20th century, both in number theory and algebraic geometry. So uh, it's obvious that uh, this is not a proof that uh, Fermat had in mind. Uh, we still don't know a purely elementary proof of the statement, so uh, it's safe to conclude that uh, Fermat either had a proof of, of a special case for some specific values of n, or uh, just a false uh, proof that he believed to be correct. So this story is, uh, is, is pretty well known. It has been uh, popularized in, in, in many ways. But when I was um, preparing for this lecture, I actually discovered uh, a fact that I, I hadn't heard before, uh, which is that uh, there's another uh, famous uh, note in the margin of uh, um, Diophantus' book uh, that has been discovered. Uh, and interestingly, it's uh, located uh, around uh, the same place as uh, the, the comment by Fermat uh, in, in a different copy of the same book. So this was a note uh, made by a Byzantine uh, monk a uh, historical namesake uh, of mine, Johannes, uh, and I have a cheat sheet, cheat sheet for his last name, uh, Cortas Menos. So he was active around the years uh, 1400. He was uh, diligently studying um, Diophantus' book and uh, obviously getting increasingly desperate because uh, he wrote in the margin, Thy soul, Diophantus, be with Satan because of the difficulty of your other theorems and particularly of the present theorem. <laughs> so... Uh, well, this was not an isolated case. Uh, Johannes uh, was certainly not alone to, to get desperate over the difficulty of the study of Diophantine equations. Uh, this was true in medieval times, and it's still true today, as we will see in this, uh, in this lecture. So as uh, guiding examples for this talk, I want to look at two other examples of, uh, of uh, Diophantine equations. And so the first equation is uh, the equation saying that uh, y squared equals uh, x cubed minus 2x plus 2. And so solving the Diophantine equation means uh, finding all the integer or rational values for x and y uh, such that this uh, equation becomes true. So um, I claim that in this case uh, we can find infinitely many rational solutions for, uh, for x and y. And so the first ones are not uh, particularly hard to, to find. If you just uh, sit down and uh, tinker a little bit with the equation, you will soon realize that if you put x equal to 1 and y equal to 1, then the left-hand side becomes equal to 1, the right-hand side becomes equal to 1, so uh, you have found a, a solution for the equation. And since both x and y are uh, rational, even integer in this case, you have even found a, a rational solution. And then the next observation is that uh, the variable y only appears with a square uh, in this equation, so uh, if we change our value for y by its uh, negative, then we, we find another solution. So these are the two solutions that you can uh, almost immediately spot. And then if you're very uh, tenacious or you have nothing else to do, uh, you continue to experiment with uh, the values for x and y. And after a serious amount of time, uh, you may come to realize that also x equal to minus 7 over 4 and y equal to plus or, three, uh, plus or minus 3 over 8, that this also produces a, a solution. Now, even if you're extremely diligent, uh, chances are slim that you will find uh, the next couple in the, in the sequence. <laughs> and uh, let alone uh, the one that comes after that. So uh, what I claim, and I will explain in a little bit where this comes from, is that we have a systematic method to produce this uh, infinite list. Uh, this list goes, goes on infinitely, many, uh, infinitely far. And uh, in this case, uh, I also claim that the list we produce by means of this uh, mysterious method contains uh, all uh, the rational solutions for the equation. So now uh, I'm going to tweak uh, this uh, equation a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to replace y squared by y cubed, and I'm going to replace x cubed by x to the power 4. 
And again, uh, there's an obvious solution to this equation. If I set uh, y equal to one and x equal to one, then uh, both sides of the equality are equal to one. But uh, despite my best efforts, uh, I wasn't able to find any others. And well, if your best efforts fail, uh, you do what any decent mathematician would do. You ask somebody who is smarter than you, <laughs> which I did. And uh, this person was also not able to come up with uh, other solutions in this case. Uh, what I do know, however, uh, and this is where things get interesting, is uh, that there are uh, only finitely many rational solutions for x and y. And so this is a very strange uh, situation because even though I'm not able to tell you all uh, the different possibilities for x and y in the rational numbers making this equation true, I am able to tell you that um, there are only finitely many of them. So let's uh, try to understand why this is the case. Uh, so how did we come up with this list of solutions in, in the first example? And how uh, do we know that there are only finitely many solutions in the, in the second example? And the surprising answer to this question is uh, geometry. So the key to understanding the properties of these equations is to look at the solutions not uh, with values in the rational numbers as, we, as, as we've been doing so far, but uh, to look at all possible complex values for x and y uh, for which the equation is, uh, is satisfied. And so what we produce in this way is not some, some kind of discrete list of points, but we uh, produce a geometric shape uh, that we can plot, uh, at least if you're able to think in a sufficient, sufficiently many dimensions. Um, and it turns out that uh, the shape of the figure that you produce in this way uh, determines to a large extent the arithmetic properties of your, uh, your equation. So this is truly one of the most profound insights uh, um, in, in, in 20th century mathematics. And uh, this is an insight that grew over the combined efforts of uh, many uh, uh, extremely bright uh, mathematicians. So in this case, uh, we were looking at examples in two variables, x and y. Uh, so in this case, if you plot uh, the set of complex solutions, and if you assume that your polynomial equation is uh, sufficiently random, uh, so there is a technical condition requiring it to be non-singular, which I put in small print because I'm not going to discuss it further. Um, well, then you can show that the solution set uh, takes the shape of an orientable surface. And such orientable surfaces can be completely classified. So we can describe their shape by means of an invariant called the genus, uh, which is uh, the number of holes in the, in the surface. So um, here you see a, a list of uh, orientable surfaces uh, starting in, in genus zero. So in genus zero, we find uh, the sphere, uh, which has no holes. In genus one, uh, we find an orientable surface with one hole, a donut, uh, which uh, because we like to be more pretentious in mathematics, we call a, a torus. Uh, in genus two, uh, you find a, a, a fat uh, figure eight. In genus three, uh, you find a fidget spinner. And then <laughs> I, I stopped the pictures because I don't know a, a, a witty name for a, a, a surface with four holes, but you can go infinitely many far uh, just by sticking more and more donuts uh, to the surface that you've uh, already produced. And uh, so uh, obviously on this list you see that uh, these surfaces can be classified into three fundamental types, uh, red, blue, and green. No, that's, uh, so genus zero stands alone, genus one stands alone, and then there are strong geometric reasons to treat all the surfaces of genus at least two uh, as a, a, a one uh, group. So they display some kind of important common uh, behavior. And what is truly remarkable is uh, that we see the same uh, trichotomy when we start studying the properties of the arithmetic uh, structure of these, uh, these equations. So when we look for uh, rational solutions, and more specifically when we try to, to count uh, rational solutions. So I claim that if uh, your complex solution set uh, looks like a sphere, uh, then you will find either zero rational solutions or infinitely many. If your complex uh, solution set looks like a donut, uh, then uh, you uh, find zero finitely many or infinitely many. So this doesn't seem to say much, but in fact, in this case, uh, we can say much, much more about the algebraic structure of the set of solutions, uh, as I will explain on, on the next slide. And then uh, probably the most remarkable case is uh, if you're a, a fidget spinner uh, or one of its neighbors, then uh, there are only finitely many uh, rational solutions. So as soon as your surface has at least uh, two holes, uh, then uh, I, I, I know for sure that the number of rational solutions will be finite. So this uh, deep uh, property was predicted or conjectured by uh, Mordell in 1922. 
and finally proven by Faltings in 1983. And this is one of the results uh, for which Faltings received uh, the Fields Medal, uh, which is the highest distinction in, uh, in mathematics. So in order for this result to be any, any, of any use in practice, uh, we need uh, to, to find a way to compute uh, the genus. And uh, here we're, we're lucky uh, because there's a very simple formula that allows you to read off uh, the genus of your surface from the shape of the uh, polynomial equation. So I claim that if uh, D is the degree of the polynomial equation, so the, degree, the highest degree of a term appearing in the equation, then you can find uh, the genus uh, by uh, plugging D into the formula D minus one times D minus two divided by, by two. Uh, so you can use some, some basic algebraic geometry to, uh, to prove this statement. And then uh, we can apply uh, this formula to the examples that we have seen before. Um, so uh, our first example uh, was this uh, equation y squared equal to x cubed minus two x plus two. So in this case, uh, the term of highest degree is x to the power of three. So uh, the degree d of our equation is equal to three. And then if we plug in uh, the value d equal to three in our expression for the genus, uh, then uh, you find uh, one. So because we find uh, an orientable surface of genus one in this case, uh, we say that uh, this equation defines an elliptic curve. So uh, it may seem counterintuitive to call something a surface and a curve uh, at the same time. So the reason is that uh, we've, we've, we view this as a one dimensional object over the complex numbers but the complex numbers, the complex plane secretly itself uh, has uh, two real dimensions. So uh, there are two real dimensions because, and therefore we speak of a surface. There's one complex dimension and therefore we speak of a curve. And so um, it's a remarkable fact that uh, using geometry, uh, you can put a very interesting structure on the set of rational solutions for your equation if uh, your equation happens to uh, define an elliptic curve. So these solutions, they carry a structure which is very similar to uh, the operation of addition that we have on the integers. And uh, this means in this example that we can generate uh, our complete list of solutions just starting from the uh, obvious solution one, one, and then produce all the others in the following way. So if I take the negative of one, one with respect to this uh, mysterious addition operation, I get one minus one. And then if I add a solution one, one to itself, with respect to this operation on the elliptic curve, I get the next uh, solution in the list, minus seven over four, uh, comma three over eight. And I can keep doing this. To each uh, solution I've already found, I can add either one, one or one minus one. There are some explicit formulas uh, that tell me how this addition operation will uh, work on this particular elliptic curve. And eventually, uh, this allows you to generate uh, this complete list, this infinitely long list of, uh, of, of solutions. It requires more, uh, more work and more technology to show that uh, all of your uh, solutions will arise in this, uh, this way, but uh, that is something that can also be, uh, be proven. And then uh, we can look at uh, the other example that I've presented. So when we slightly change the equation, uh, y cubed equal to x to the power four minus two x plus two, so although this equation is very similar to the previous one, uh, the behavior we observe is drast drastically different. Because if we now uh, compute the degree of the equation, the degree will be four. Uh, the highest degree term in the expression is x to the power four. And then if we use uh, the degree formula to compute the genus, we find that the genus is uh, three. So instead of falling into the, the donut category, we fall into the category of the fidget spinner and its, uh, its neighbors. Uh, and as we've seen, uh, Mordell's conjecture and Faltings' theorem uh, tells us that in this case, there are only finitely many uh, rational solutions. So even though I'm not able to pin down exactly what they are, geometry uh, tells me that the number will be, will be finite. Now, if you're a, a mathematician, it's your job to be uh, not easily satisfied. So uh, if you know that there are only finitely many rational solutions, you want to find them all. And uh, more generally, not only for this equation, if we start from any polynomial equation of degree at least four uh, with integer coefficients in the variables x and y, then the degree formula will tell you that uh, we're in the third uh, case of our trichotomy. The genus will be at least two, in fact, at least uh, three in this case. So we know that there are only finitely many rational solutions for X and Y, uh, well, how can we find them, them all? So uh, what we want is some kind of systematic procedure that would allow us to write down uh, all of the solutions uh, for equations of this, uh, of this type.
The first uh, method uh, you can, can try is uh, also the most naive. It's some kind of brute force method. Uh, so uh, when you're clever in writing down uh, all possible fractions, all possible rational numbers, you can actually uh, organize all possible values for x and y in a, in a list. So you can start writing down a list of couples, x0, y0, then x1, y1, x2, y2. And if you organize things in the, in the right way, you can produce such an infinitely long list, uh, such that every possible couple of rational numbers will uh, appear exactly once. And then uh, we just run through the list, and for each of these couples, uh, we check whether um, it's a solution of the equation or, or not. So this will not be a very pleasant exercise, but uh, we can try, uh, try and do it anyway. And we are certain if we have uh, infinite, uh, an infinite amount of time that uh, at the end of days uh, we will have a complete list of solutions uh, because we know that there are only finitely many and they must all be contained in this list. So uh, we can't wait until the end of days, so we would like to know when, uh, when to stop. Uh, and that's uh, the essential problem in this case because uh, Faltings' theorem doesn't give us any upper bound on the number of solutions. Uh, and even better, ideally, uh, we would like uh, to know in advance, uh, we'd like to know something about um, the, the size of the solutions. So the ideal uh, result would be something that tells us, uh, that gives us an upper bound for the absolute values of the numerators and denominators of uh, the solutions x and y. Of course, this bound will depend on the specific equation, but uh, we would like to have uh, some kind of theorem uh, or uh, an algorithm that tells us, well, if this is your equation, then I can predict in advance that the uh, size of the numerator and denominator of all solutions will be at most uh, 20 billion. So that's still uh, a lot of cases to check, but uh, it's only finitely many cases. Uh, so then we are certain that our procedure will stop in, uh, in finite time. So sadly, uh, such a, a bound is still unknown. Um, it's expected that it exists, so that uh, such a, a theorem should be somewhere out there in the mathematical universe. And in fact, uh, it would follow from a, a suitably effective form of uh, the uh, notorious ABC conjecture. So there are mathematical reasons to believe that uh, such a bound can, uh, can be found. But uh, since uh, we don't have the suitable form of the ABC conjecture yet, uh, we currently don't know any algorithm uh, that allows us to find all solutions uh, in a finite time, even though we strongly believe that such an algorithm must, uh, must exist. So this is uh, kind of uh, humbling and slightly embarrassing because even these very elementary problems uh, that were already studied by Diophantus and which drove uh, my namesake Johannes uh, something something to uh, semi-madness, um, these uh, continue to haunt us uh, today. Now then, uh, we can try to uh, slightly zoom out. So, so far, um, we have been looking at equations uh, in only two variables, x and y. So we can try to formulate the same question uh, about equations in uh, any finite number of, uh, of variables. And in fact, this problem uh, was one of the key problems uh, considered by uh, David Hilbert. Uh, so in 1900, uh, David Hilbert gave a, a very famous uh, address to the mathematical community. And afterwards, he published a famous list of 23 mathematical problems, which he considered to be uh, the most important challenges for the 20th century. So some of these problems uh, have been solved in the meantime. For others, uh, it has been accepted that they were ill-posed, Ill and so it was impossible to give a definite answer. Some of these problems are still open. For instance, uh, the Riemann hypothesis was already there. Uh, it's still one of the most important problems in mathematics uh, today. So in general, this list of problems formulated by Hilbert has been very influential for the development of mathematics in the 20th century. And if you scrutinize this list on a number or place 10, uh, we find exactly the problem that is occupying us here. So Hilbert's 10th problem uh, asks us to find uh, an algorithm to determine whether a given polynomial equation with integer coefficients has uh, an integer solution or not. So in, in this formulation of the problem, I insist that I want to know whether there exists a solution such that uh, all the coordinates are uh, integers rather than rational numbers. I'll come back to the other case uh, in, in a little bit. So when we would try to, to formulate such a problem in a more contemporary language, uh, we would ask for a computer program. 
So uh, in modern terms, uh, the challenge would be to write a computer program that uh, if we feed it any polynomial with integer coefficients as input, produces one of two possible outcomes. Either it tells us, well, this equation has an integer solution, or it produces this equation as no integer solution. So we're very modest at this point. Uh, we're not uh, asking the computer program to produce integer solutions. We just ask it to tell us whether there exists one or whether we shouldn't bother because there, there won't be one uh, at all. So uh, to illustrate this, let's look at some, some elementary examples. So uh, in this uh, slide, uh, the role of the algorithm is uh, played by uh, Hal from 2001 A Space Odyssey. So suppose that uh, Hal uh, is uh, such an algorithm of the type that, um, that uh, Hilbert was asking for. Then how should it operate? Uh, well, if we feed it, for instance, the equation x cubed plus y cubed minus one equal to zero, Hal should be able to answer us uh, that this equation has an integer solution. This is something we can see right away. For instance, if we set x equal to one and y equal to zero, then uh, we have found a solution to this equation. On the other hand, uh, if we feed Hal uh, an equation of the type x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus one equal to zero, well, in this case, we can also uh, easily decide that there will not be an integer solution, because if x, y, and z are any three integers, their squares will be uh, non-negative numbers. So if we sum them and uh, we add one, we find something which is at least one, uh, so in any case, different from, uh, from zero. So in this case, uh, Hal uh, should be able to decide uh, there's no integer, integer solution. Oh, of course, the examples I've picked here are quite elementary. Here we can see immediately uh, that there is a solution in the first case and that there's no solution in the second case. Because this problem, but this problem becomes much more intricate uh, if we pick more complicated um, e equations. Now, surprisingly, uh, in 1970, uh, the Russian mathematician Matiasevich proved that such an algorithm does not exist. So uh, it's not that we don't know how to, to program a computer to do this. It's not that we don't know how to write such an algorithm. You can actually prove mathematically that it's impossible to write such an algorithm. Uh, so such an algorithm simply cannot exist for de very deep and, and fundamental reasons. And because this is the case, we say that the problem of determining whether a polynomial equation with integer coefficients has integer solutions, uh, we say that this problem is undecidable. So this means that uh, precisely that uh, it's impossible to write an algorithm that solves this uh, problem for us. So it's very important to, to understand exactly what is the extent of this statement. So if I give you one concrete polynomial, then uh, of course it will either have uh, integer solutions or not. And uh, there are various methods that you can try uh, to produce an answer for specific polynomials or specific classes of polynomials. But what uh, Matiasevich has, uh, uh, sorry, has proven is that uh, you can't write one procedure uh, that uh, gives you the correct answer in all possible cases. And uh, remarkably, uh, the analogous problem for rational solutions, so if we want to train a computer or, or program a computer to uh, detect the existence of rational solutions, this is still open. So uh, we don't know whether such an algorithm exists or, or not. So explaining uh, Matiasevich's proof would uh, lead us a bit too far uh, astray. Um, it's uh, quite technical and builds upon the work of uh, many mathematicians uh, before him. Uh, but there are some uh, variants of this result uh, that are easier to, uh, to explain and that have also played an incredibly important role in, uh, in mathematics. In fact, the existence of such undecidable problems uh, was one of the most important insights uh, of 20th century mathematical logic. And uh, one of the most famous instances of this, uh, uh, of this uh, phenomenon um, is the following result by Alan Turing. Uh, so Alan Turing is uh, famous for, for many reasons, some uh, very positive, others very sad. Uh, so he's mostly known for his work at Bletchley Park, uh, cracking the uh, Enigma code during World War II. Uh, he's also known for being uh, played by Benedict Cumberbatch in the film The Imitation Game, which came out a couple of years ago. So, uh, <coughs> For those of you who are not completely connected to popular culture, on the left you see Alan Turing, on the right you see <laughs> Benedict Cumberbatch. So um, Alan Turing he gave another example of an uh, undecidable problem. Uh, Turing he showed that there is no algorithm 
that can decide whether any given algorithm with any given input terminates in, in finite time. So I should say that uh, Alan Turing was not only a brilliant mathematician, uh, he's also considered to be one of the, the founding fathers of uh, computer science. And one of his great contributions was to give a precise definition of the word uh, algorithm. So Turing came up with some kind of idealized uh, computing machine called uh, a Turing machine, uh, which is completely unfit for practical purposes, uh, but which is able to simulate any algorithm that we can program on a modern computer. So the device is very simple. Uh, it uses an infinitely long strip, uh, which plays the role of memory. It has a hat that is able to read symbols of the strip and write symbols on the strip and then uh, move to the left or the right according to the instructions of the, of the program and the input that it receives. So uh, every algorithm that you can write on a contemporary computer can also be programmed on a Turing machine. Again, it will be in incredibly unpleasant. Uh, it will take you a lot of time, uh, but it can be done, which makes this uh, Turing machines very useful for uh, theoretical considerations about uh, computability and decidability. And in fact, um, it's not too, too hard uh, to, to explain the, the central idea behind Turing's theorem about the undecidability of the halting problem. So the first step is uh, to uh, come up with a, a system to attach unique numbers, A and I, to each uh, algorithm and each input. So uh, the Turing machine accepts uh, uh, algorithms or uh, instructions that are written in a certain form, in a certain language. And then you can uh, encode each uh, um, symbol in this language by means of uh, an integer, for instance, by a prime number. And then by taking suitable combinations of these prime numbers, you can attach a unique number to each algorithm. Uh, this number uh, is denoted by A on the slide. And uh, we can do the same thing for every possible input. So we can uh, translate each uh, input string to a, a unique uh, number, which we call i. So suppose uh, for a contradiction that we do have an algorithm that decides whether any given algorithm with any given input finishes in, in finite time. So uh, this algorithm would operate in the following way. Uh, it takes as input a uh, couple consisting of uh, two numbers, number A and a number I. And then uh, it produces uh, one of two possible outputs. Either it tells us yes, uh, if we run algorithm A with input I, then it will stop after finitely many steps. Or it should tell us no, if we run algorithm A with input I, then it will enter an infinite loop and it will uh, continue running uh, infinitely uh, long. So uh, notice that, uh, well, deciding the yes case is not too hard because this you could do just by running the algorithm and checking when it stops. Deciding the no case is much more difficult. In fact, it's similar to our procedure for finding all rational solutions before because uh, we can observe that the algorithm keeps running, but uh, we can't decide, uh, or it's not obvious how to decide whether it will stop 10 billion years in the future or it will run uh, forever. Uh, so that's exactly the difficulty that we are facing here. And now, uh, Turing's uh, brilliant idea was to tweak this algorithm in the following way. So uh, we uh, slightly rebuilt uh, this algorithm uh, such that it takes as input only one number, the number A for algorithm. So uh, we feed this number into uh, our algorithm and then, in, as in the previous step, the algorithm will tell us yes if uh, uh, the algorithm A with input A uh, stops after finitely many steps and will tell us no if this algorithm A with input A enters an infinite loop. But now uh, we add one more tweak to, uh, to the construction. If our original algorithm produces the output yes, then we add an infinite loop uh, to the procedure such that our algorithm actually runs uh, for forever. So if we, could do, uh, if we could build the algorithm on the previous slide, then sorry, we can also build the algorithm on, on this slide. And now something very strange happens if we try uh, to feed uh, this algorithm its own number. So this is again an algorithm that we can simulate on a Turing machine. So it is uh, encoded or described by a unique number, some value of, of A. So what happens uh, if we give uh, this algorithm its own number as input? So the number A goes into uh, HAL, into the red light, and then HAL decides, uh, yes, algorithm A with input A stops after finitely many steps. Then we actually, uh, run into an infinite loop. 
if uh, Hal decides uh, no algorithm A with input A enters an infinite loop, then we stop. So this always produces uh, contradictory results. Hal is always wrong about uh, this uh, particular algorithm because it's, it gives uh, exactly the, the opposite uh, answer. So the conclusion that we draw from, from this uh, thought experiment is that uh, such an algorithm as we conceived on the previous slide cannot exist. So we cannot build an algorithm that in all cases is able to decide whether a given algorithm A with given input I stops after fi finitely many steps or, or not. And well, uh, as long as we're in the business of uh, blowing minds, uh, we can add one more level of, uh, of abstraction. Um, so one of the first and most influential uh, um, results about undecidability uh, was a result by uh, Kurt uh, Gödel in 1931. Um, so Gödel was a brilliant logician. Uh, he's also unfortunately a very sad illustration of the fact that logicians uh, uh, in the course of history seem to be followed by some kind of, of curse. So many of them uh, actually started to um, battle with uh, mental health problems uh, in their lives. And Gödel is a particularly bad example because uh, he, had, uh, he developed some form of paranoia uh, leading him to only accept food from his wife. Uh, when his wife was hospitalized, uh, he starved to death because uh, the, he, he was unable to, to, to feed himself. So, uh, well, f f let's <laughs> try not to dwell too much on uh, th th this, type of, uh, this type of story. Uh, I'm not even sure why I, I had to bring it up in the first place. <laughs> Um, but uh, in any case, uh, when he was still uh, a young and healthy gentleman, um, he proved um, a remarkable theorem uh, which uh, states that in any reasonable axiomatization of the natural numbers, uh, one can formulate a mathematical version of the Lyers paradox. So the Lyers paradox uh, is a, a famous uh, philosophical statement uh, which is supposed to uh, illustrate the problematic nature of, uh, of statements in, in, in philosophical logic. So the liar's paradox uh, says this statement is a lie. The problem is that uh, if this statement is true, then it's false. And if this statement is false, then it's true. So the conclusion is that it's impossible to assign a truth value to this uh, statement. And uh, phil philosophers have debated wide and far about uh, what this tells us about the uh, nature of logic, about truth, and, and so on. So what uh, Gödel showed was uh, that um, similar but not exactly identical problems occur in uh, everyday mathematics. So um, he studied the structure of the natural numbers with the uh, usual addition and multiplication. Um, and uh, he showed that as soon as you take a, a reasonable axiomatization for the natural numbers, you will run into a problem which is similar to the liar's paradox. So axiomatization means that we try to write down a set of rules, uh, a set of statements uh, which are true for the natural numbers and which are supposed to tell us everything we need to know about natural numbers to be able to deduce formally uh, all their, their properties. So they kind of lay down the rules of the game, and once we uh, accept these, uh, these axioms, we expect that we can use mathematical logic, uh, formal manipulations to deduce uh, all true statements from, uh, from them. And reasonable means that uh, we are not allowed to, to cheat. Uh, of course, uh, it's very easy to come up with a foolproof system of axioms. I can just take the collection of all true statements about the natural numbers, and then I'm done. Uh, so in order to avoid this type of, uh, of abuse, um, we uh, insist that uh, my system should be computable in the sense that I can program a computer to tell me whether any given statement belongs to the list of axioms or, uh, or not. So uh, that would be a workable uh, set of axioms if you like. Oops. Yep, there we go. Uh, so what Gödel uh, showed is that uh, within such a system, you can mathematically formulate the following statement. This statement cannot be proved from uh, the given axioms. So this is uh, Gödel's paradox, uh, but I put paradox between quotation marks uh, because it's not actually a paradox. We are able to determine the truth value of this statement. So if the statement uh, were false, then uh, we would be able to deduce it from the given axioms, which would make it true. So the conclusion is that the statement must be true, but uh, that also means that there exist statements about the natural numbers that we cannot formally deduce uh, from our choice of uh, axiom uh, system. When I heard this for the first time, it really blew my mind. In fact, uh, there's a personal backstory connected to, uh, to this. 
because uh, as Mark already explained in the introduction, uh, for me it was not always obvious that I would become a mathematician. And in my final year of high school, I had my mind set on doing something else. Until I went to an open day in the mathematics department at the University of Leuven, and uh, one of the professors was giving a talk about uh, Gödel's uh, theorem. And at that point, I decided uh, this is what I want to do. And this was so different from the tedious calculus that we had been doing in high school that uh, I decided to, to enroll uh, in the mathematics program. And the person giving the talk later become my, uh, became my thesis uh, advisor. Slightly disappointingly, the first year of the program still consisted of tedious uh, calculus. <laughs> But uh, afterwards, uh, things got, got better, and uh, we actually came to the point where we could prove uh, something like this, uh, like this theorem, which was very uh, satisfactory. Oops. So what Gödel's theorem and uh, subsequent work by uh, Church and Turing uh, established was, uh, well, it gave a fatal blow to uh, another part of Hilbert's problem, uh, program. Uh, Hilbert formulated uh, what's called the Entscheidungsproblem, or decision problem, uh, which uh, essentially is the dream of some kind of universal proof machine. So around 1900, uh, there was some kind of foundational crisis in mathematics. Uh, it seemed that uh, especially theory of sets was on very loose, uh, loose foundations, and uh, Hilbert tried to come up with a fix for this issue. So uh, his program was first to write down a clear list of uh, axioms for structures like the natural numbers, which are fundamental to uh, the entirety of mathematics, to come up uh, with uh, a formal list of uh, logical manipulations that we could use to deduce all possible true statements from these axioms, and finally uh, to uh, come up with a way to prove the consistency of the axioms uh, from uh, the axioms themselves. So this would give you a sound uh, foundation for the whole of mathematics, and uh, what Gödel proved was that this is, uh, this is impossible. So for any sufficiently rich mathematical structure, sufficiently rich meaning that it's at least uh, as rich as the natural numbers, and any computable axiom system, there are true statements that cannot be formally deduced from, from the axioms. And as we've seen both in uh, Gödel's uh, result and in Turing's results, the essential problem is uh, self-reference. So as soon as you're able to encode things like addition, multiplication, prime numbers, uh, then you're able to force the system to start referring to its own structure. And then you uh, will run into uh, uh, quotation mark paradoxes like the ones uh, in, in Gödel's theorem or in uh, uh, Turing's undecidability uh, theorem. So this is the reason why uh, computers can't replace uh, mathematicians yet. Uh, testing the truth values of mathematical statements is not a purely formal uh, enterprise. So like any good mathematician, I forgot to check when I started. <laughs> uh, but uh, I just want to wrap, uh, wrap up my talk uh, by saying a little bit about uh, what I'm working on myself without going in, into the technical details. So in my own research, I consider a, a different type of Diophantine problem, uh, which arises in the following way. So we, we take a polynomial f with integer coefficients uh, in uh, any finite number of variables, x1 to xn. For instance, one of the examples that we've seen at the beginning of the talk. We fix a prime number p, and uh, we fix a positive integer d. And so for any choice of these data, we can ask the, the following question. Let's uh, consider all the possible uh, n-tuples uh, of uh, integers lying in the range from 0 to p to the power d minus 1. So uh, for every such uh, choice of n tuple a, we can evaluate the polynomial f at a, uh, producing as output uh, an integer. And we can ask uh, whether or not this integer is divisible by p to the power d. So we would like to understand uh, how many uh, n tuples a have this property for all possible values of the prime p and all possible values of the positive integer d. So this is an arithmetic statement, which is a bit different from Diophantine equations that we saw before, but uh, which has a very similar flavor. So it may seem a bit artificial uh, that we uh, only uh, restrict ourselves to this uh, set where the coordinates of uh, A are allowed to lie uh, in the range from 0 to P to the power D minus 1. So, so why is this not an absurd thing to do? Well, first of all, there's a very pragmatic reason. It guarantees that the uh, number of solutions will be finite, since I have only finitely many possibilities for the tuple A to, to begin with. But on a more serious level, uh, this uh, range already tells me everything I need to know. Because if I take uh, any other tuple b, uh, such that p to the power d divides f of b, then I can always write b of the form 
A, where A is a solution lying in my favorite range, plus uh, P to the power D times uh, some arbitrary n-tuple C of, net of integers. So this means that if I can solve my problem for all the tuples A that lie in my favorite range, then I actually have solved my, my problem in, in all possible cases. And in mathematical lingo, uh, we say that we are uh, counting solutions of the congruence uh, given by F congruent to zero modulo P to the power D. So what we would like to understand about these solutions is, uh, well, we count them, uh, and we would like to understand the patterns that occur in these numbers of solutions as, as D grows. So I can check uh, how many solutions I can find modulo P, so, so, so that the output of F is divisible by P, then P squared, P to the power three, P to the, P to the power four, and so on. So uh, for each uh, exponent uh, of P, I, I find one number. I organize these numbers into a list, and I want to know, uh, well, what are the hidden structures that uh, exist in this list? And just like in uh, the case of our uh, Diophantine equations, it turns out that uh, these patterns are um, controlled by geometry. So in this case, they are not controlled by the genus, but they are controlled by uh, so-called singularities of the set of complex solutions of the equation f equal to zero. So I won't uh, give you a technical definition of the notion of singularity. I will just give you an example. So on the picture, I have plotted uh, solutions of uh, the equation x squared minus y squared z equal to zero. Um, so I haven't uh, plotted all the complex solutions because that would give me a four-dimensional object, uh, which is difficult to put on a slide. I've just uh, plotted all the solutions where x, y, and z are, are real numbers. Uh, but this already illustrates uh, what I want to explain. So first of all, you get a pretty picture, uh, which is called the Whitney umbrella, because, uh, well, if you're sufficiently rich in fantasy, it looks like an umbrella, uh, but like many mathematical solutions, it would not be a very practical umbrella. Um, but uh, we see on this picture that there are two types of points. So if you pick a random point and your Whitney umbrella just, likes, uh, just looks like a, a plane that you have slightly bent, so these we call smooth. And then for the points lying on the vertical axis, uh, these we call singularities because there something strange happens. Uh, the surface uh, starts to, to cut itself. So these are the singularities that I was uh, referring to in my, uh, in my statement. And uh, so also in this case, it turns out that uh, patterns of these, uh, these numbers that arose from our arithmetic problem, uh, solving congruences modular powers of P, that these patterns are related to the geometry of singularities, and a precise formulation of this relation was uh, given by uh, Igusa around uh, 1980. So uh, for completeness sake, uh, I've written down the statement of the conjecture. Uh, if you don't work with these things every day, I don't expect uh, this to mean anything to you. But uh, what the conjecture states is that uh, some uh, object that encodes the arithmetic properties of uh, the polynomial f, called the periodic local zeta function, so this is some clever way using complex analysis to uh, control the numbers of solutions that we find in, in number theory. This should be related to uh, an invariant called the Bernstein polynomial. The Bernstein polynomial is another very subtle invariant which uh, measures uh, the nature of the singularities of the complex solution set of the polynomial f. And so we expect uh, that these two talk to each other in, uh, in, this, uh, in this manner. So uh, many special cases of this conjecture are now understood, uh, but uh, the general problem is still wide open, and it's fair to say that we, don't, uh, we haven't found the ultimate explanation uh, yet why, why such a statement should, should be true. So again, we see some kind of mysterious uh, correspondence between number theory on the one hand and geometry on the, the other hand, and the challenge is to explain where it comes from. So one of, one of the things I did in recent years uh, was uh, to prove not exactly this conjecture, unfortunately, but uh, a, a subcase of it, uh, which had independently been conjectured by, by other people. And um, the interesting thing is that uh, we arrived at this uh, solution by throwing even more mathematics into the mix. Um, so I just want to show you a diagram illustrating the different branches of uh, mathematics uh, that play the role in the, in the solution. So obviously we have number theory and singularity theory because they already appear in the statement of the problem. Then we have uh, a field called motivic integration, another field called non-Archimedean geometry. And finally, most surprising of all, also a string theory has uh, something to say uh, in a very indirect way about uh, this type of problem. So a string theory is a, a theory that arose in, in physics, mathematical physics, which uh, claims to give a theoretical description of the universe. 
So uh, physicists will uh, have uh, long and hot debates over to what extent this is true, to what extent string theory is a faithful representation of the universe. But it has been extremely influential uh, in uh, mathematics, especially in algebraic and uh, differential geometry, because it makes uh, very strong and, and surprising predictions about the shapes of mathematical objects. So to conclude, let me summarize by saying that uh, even one of the oldest uh, branches of mathematics, the theory of uh, Diophantine equations, is still full of mystery. Uh, and we can continue to uh, commiserate with uh, Johannes uh, Costa Menos, something, something. Uh, if somebody has uh, today another copy of uh, the Arithmetica of the Afantas, or maybe one of the papers written by more modern authors in this field, you may still find some uh, students' uh, desperate uh, notes in the margin, cursing uh, uh, their professors uh, and everybody related to them. And we've also seen that there are uh, fundamental boundaries uh, to what current computers can actually say about uh, such problems. So it's not impossible, I mean, uh, I'm on very thin ice here, but uh, why do I write current computers? Perhaps uh, we can come up with some kind of artificial intelligence which is able to uh, achieve in mathematics what humans can achieve uh, one day. After all, humans are not uh, foolproof either. Also, we don't know how to uh, solve all possible equations. Uh, but uh, if we conceive uh, algorithms in a more classical, formal way, then as we've seen, there are some theoretical limitations to uh, what these algorithms can, can do for us. We've also seen that uh, problems in one branch of mathematics uh, are often connected to other parts of mathematics in very profound and, and surprising ways. And so in conclusion, uh, well, for me and my colleagues, it means that uh, we're not out of a job yet. So uh, it doesn't seem that, uh, sorry, ooh, human uh, mathematical creativity will uh, be superseded anytime soon, as is uh, nicely illustrated uh, by this beautiful cartoon uh, from uh, Calvin and Hobbes. So uh, that's all I wanted to, to say. <laughs>
And uh, if it uh, concludes that each line has been uh, deduced from previous lines by means of a valid argument, then it will tell us that the proof is correct. Uh, when a human produces a proof, uh, well, if you're very unfortunate, uh, you will find such proofs in some papers where you have to read line by line and convince yourself that every line follows from the preceding one. But if you want to make uh, any type uh, of uh, advance in mathematics, you also want to know not only that a result is true, but why, why it is true. So you want to detect the deeper concepts in, uh, in mathematics that are behind uh, specific results like Fermat's last theorem. Fermat's last theorem in itself is completely useless. Uh, I don't know of any uh, application of this uh, specific statement. But uh, it has led to these beautiful insights about the relations between geometry and, uh, and number theory. And ultimately, those insights are what mathematicians are uh, after. So uh, I don't know uh, how someday computers could simulate uh, this, this type of insight. On the other hand, I'm also not able to give you any concrete instance of something a human can do and where I'm certain that a computer will never, never be able to, to, to do it. Uh, Perhaps some, somebody else has uh, deeper things to say about that, but uh, that's as far as it goes uh, for, for me. Okay. Uh, other questions? Over here. Uh, so I was wondering about the, like the Turing machine. Yeah. How the Turing proof can improve. Yeah. With the self-referential stuff. Yeah. With sets, you have like set or sets as well, and that's kind of self-referential as well. Is there, and then you can like solve that by using classes as well? Yep. Is there no way to like restrict the algorithm to determine if algorithm, like, is there no way to restrict them so they don't refer to themselves? Um, maybe the other, the other way around, so you can try to build some kind of uh, hierarchy of uh, Turing machines. Uh, by equipping them with more, uh, more features uh, so that you're able to distinguish different uh, levels of structure like exactly in the theory of uh, sets, classes, and, uh, and, and so on. So uh, there are theoretical proposals for, for this type of, uh, of thing, uh, but uh, they, they don't uh, solve the insight that if you uh, interpret algorithm as something that we can currently program on a computer, uh, then these are the boundaries of what you can, uh, you can actually achieve. We have a question over on the other side. Hello, prof Hello Professor. Uh, in the lecture, you mentioned one thing that is called turning machine. And uh, you, you write a um, theoretical model of a universal computing machine. What do you mean by that? Um, so, <coughs> There is a general, uh, so this is part of a philosophical uh, discussion. So there is something called uh, the church um, uh, Turing hypothesis, uh, which appears in many, uh, well, or under many other names in the literature. Um, so the, the hypothesis states that everything that is uh, effectively <coughs> computable can be computed by means of a Turing machine. Uh, unfortunately, this is not a type of statement that we can formally prove because uh, there's no uh, rigorous definition of what it means to be effectively computable. Uh, it's just expected that uh, anything that any type of algorithm one could possibly imagine can achieve can be achieved on a Turing machine. Uh, but in Turing's work, uh, you kind of revert the logic by saying my definition of algorithm is something that I can compute on a Turing machine, and then you run into this type of undecidability uh, problems. So it's universal in the sense that uh, all the known methods we have to write an algorithm uh, can also be uh, realized on a, on a Turing machine. Okay, a question in the back. Um, so uh, in algebraic geometry, uh, we would uh, try to encode uh, shapes of these objects into the uh, algebraic properties of the equations. So you're perfectly right that uh, it's extremely difficult to form some kind of intuitive geometric picture of uh, what these uh, shapes turn out to be. 
uh, but uh, there are methods uh, which are purely algebraic in nature to detect uh, the presence of uh, singularities. We can algebraically manipulate uh, the equations to uh, come up with a complete description of the, the set of singularities, and we can use algebraic invariants to, to describe these, uh, these singularities. So uh, yeah, the key idea behind algebraic geometry is that there's some kind of um, um, symmetry behind algebraic properties of our equation on, on the one hand, and the uh, geometric shapes uh, that they define on the other hand. And so when uh, visualization fails, when we go up in dimension, we can still rely on the algebra to do, to do the geometric work uh, for us. Down in front. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, it's about the Turing machine. Because I found like a lot of examples when people talk about Turing machines. And every kind of example to the question relates with self-referencing. Mm -hmm. So I ask, is there any other examples of the way without relating to self-referencing? Oh, well, uh, Matiasevich's theorem uh, would, be, uh, would be an example. Uh, so uh, the theorem about uh, the non-existence of an algorithm uh, to check uh, whether uh, uh, a polynomial equation has an integer solution or not. So you don't explicitly see uh, self-reference uh, appear in this, uh, in this problem. Uh, it seems like a very tractable mathematical problem that we should be able to decide. But uh, Matiasevich, has, uh, Matiasevich has proven that it's still uh, un undecidable. Okay, but that, it, is that true to, in a way like to prove it as a, like, similar to a self-referencing problem? Uh, it, in the end, uh, if you dig through the, the proof of, uh, of uh, Matiasevich's theorem, that is certainly true. So uh, you assume that such an algorithm exists, and then you again build on this algorithm to produce uh, paradoxes like, uh, like the one in, in Gödel's result. So uh, yeah, it, it's true that ultimately the, the proof of undecidability very often relies on this problem of self-reference. But uh, the appearance of undecidability is not some purely uh, philosophical or academic question. It actually occurs in very concrete problems that uh, everyday mathematicians care, uh, care about. Okay. Uh, but I mean, I mean there's like, is anything like, even when in the proof, we haven't met any self-referencing, just can't decide, it's, it's an undecided problem, but in a different class. No. Uh, yeah, so I don't, uh, I'm not aware of, uh, of any proofs that uh, don't make use of this uh, principle of self-reference in, uh, in any way. That's, uh, that's right. Thank you. I, mean, I can add in, in, in set theory, there are independence proofs for things such as axiom of choice, which are not of this flavor. You prove that you can't prove the axiom of choice uh, from the, the axioms of set theory uh, without self, you know, issues of self-reference. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a somewhat different approach. <coughs> ah, question over there. Thanks for the, thanks for the very nice talk. Thank you. Um, the, uh, I think probably most mathematicians would, would agree that there's a large amount of luck involved in finding um, you know, a breakthrough uh, theorem. Now, if I reflect that then into into the computational side of things, if I add random choice into my model of computation, then I can do more than um, than Kevin said of checking uh, a theorem of, of this. I can also discover it with with finite probability in yep. a finite amount of time. Yep. So I'm wondering whether um, whether you have any similar statements about defense on equations um, that rely on probabilistic analyses or probabilistic arguments? Uh, I think that's a very interesting question. Uh, I'm also afraid that it lies a little bit on the, on the boundary of what I personally know about uh, the subject. <coughs> so uh, certainly to deal more generally with these undecidability problems, uh, people have looked at variants uh, where uh, there's some, some, some random element uh, in, introduced. Uh, and. Uh, of course, uh, as you say, in, in mathematics, uh, we are very happy if we are certain that uh, if we have a method that gives us uh, the right answer in 99% of the cases, that's already quite, <laughs> quite something. That's uh, a result to, uh, to celebrate. So um, yeah, I'm afraid I don't have a very definite answer to your question, uh, but uh, it, it is a very interesting one, uh, and there are certainly people who have looked into this, uh, this type of, uh, of things. Uh, 
Hi. Um, I just wonder, uh, what's the situation when um, quantum computers are involved? Uh, are there any uh, research on undecidability and quantum Turing machines? Uh, again, I think that's a fascinating question, but that definitely goes beyond my, uh, my competences. Um, so uh, it's very natural to ask if you are able to, well, it goes a little bit into the, the, the random element that was introduced in the previous question. So it's a na very natural to ask if you come up with a drastically new method uh, to, to organize a computer algorithm, uh, how the situation changes. Ah, but it looks like Kevin has an answer to your question. I see. Things that we can't solve in polynomial time, we certainly can if we have a lot of computers, but things that we can't solve, we can't solve. I see. Thank you. Okay, thanks. <coughs> so I think we are, we are running a bit late, so we might want to bring the question and answer session to an end. Uh, so let's all thank uh, Professor Niquez again. <laughs> for And I, I turn things over to uh, Richard Thomas. I think that was my job, was to. Uh, I'm supposed to give the vote of thanks to uh, Johanna. So. Uh, That's a different vote of thanks. It, is that right? Then I may have misunderstood my role. Um, I'll just very briefly say something about Johannes. So we heard Johannes came to us from Belgium, uh, a country with famously dysfunctional government. He wanted to, um, he wanted to move... He wanted to move to a country uh, with efficient, uh, professional uh, <laughs> politicians able to uh, reach across partisan divides to uh, govern competently. Um, and a few weeks later, we voted for Brexit. Um, but uh, I remember Johannes applying to us very well because uh, we'd advertised a job. We, we kept it rather broad, but we knew we didn't want an algebraic geometer because there's too many of us, and we didn't want a number theorist, because there's too many of them. And uh, <laughs> Johannes is both an algebraic geometer <laughs> and a number theorist, uh, so we needed to kick him out of the list somehow, but his, his CV was so um, spectacular, we felt we had to interview him. Uh, someone was given the job of sort of coming up with a question to ask all of the, all of the interviewees that would uh, stump Johannes this... Uh, <laughs> this otherworldly abstract pure mathematician. Uh, so the question was obviously, you know, how would you cope with dealing with 250, dealing with lecturing 250 first year undergraduates? Um, and Johannes very modestly uh, just explained that um, in his lectures to 800 Belgian undergraduates, <laughs> uh, he used various techniques in order to... Uh, um, so yeah, he's a fantastic colleague. I, I'm sure you've seen or can imagine he's one of our most popular undergraduate lecturers. He's also incredibly hardworking, selfless. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say it with our head of department here, but uh, there's nothing he won't do for his colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> so you can give him some more jobs tomorrow. Um, uh, so uh, I would like to thank him as a colleague, but also if we could all thank him for uh, a wonderful lecture. And uh, the last thing is, uh, is alcohol outside for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah.